What's good, everybody? This is Jay, and this is my true story for Stanley Tookie Williams. Now, this right here, this video is going to be a breakdown of the life and death of Stanley Tookie Williams, one of the founding members of the Crips gang in California. Now, this is based off of interviews and testimony of people that he knew. So hit that like bang that bell subscribe if you're new sit back relax and i'm gonna break it on down about stanley tookie williams now we know that he was a founding member of the crips now tookie was born december 29th 1953 in shreveport louisiana his mom later moved the family to L.A. looking for a better job and ended up settling in the South Central area. Now, South Central was all black at the time, and a lot of people wondered the name Tookie, but it was given to him by his mom. It was said that his grandpa was named Tookie, and his dad was also a Tookie, so it's a family name, but nobody ever called him Stanley. He was bullied by some older kids when he was younger, but he beat them up and started to earn their respect. He even spent some time in juvie as a kid. In 1969, a 16-year-old Tookie was arrested on charges of auto theft and sent to Los Padrinos Juvie Hall. That's where he had learned his passion for weightlifting. His rep for fighting and size started to get well known and he became known as a monster he had began a clique and it began to grow and they would clash with rival cliques that would later become sets and 71 was a game changing moment for Tookie Bob Creer an original West Side Crip member remembers what happened he said that they got into a fight with Raymond Washington from the east side he said the 110 freeway runs down the middle of L.A. and splits it east and west. He said Raymond Washington was east side and they got to know each other and eventually joined up. They founded the Crips, quickly becoming the street gang in South Central. In the beginning, they were more helpful and not so much about selling drugs, according to Bob Creer. They did do wrong, but was about neighborhood protection more so, and not about killing. They eventually grew their clique by growing, by walking neighborhood to neighborhood, recruiting people. And they grew to Compton, Inglewood, and South Central. And as they grew, they began to get police attention. Now, the LA uh, Police Department created an anti-gang unit deal with the growing Crips. Ken Bell was in the very first anti-gang unit. He said they paid attention to Tookie from the very start. His reputation was large at the time and included violence, according to Ken Bell. He became known for taking what he wanted. Uh, according to Bob Creer, he said that once Tookie saw a guy walking with a boom box and he ended up knocking dude out and took the box he said i'm gonna take it and he did now fred shaw jr he spoke about his father fred shaw senior who had group homes he said that he gave jobs to gang leaders as counselors and that tookie was one of the counselors and not only was he one of the counselors but he was one of the best counselors they had he said kids would listen and look up to him, and Tookie was even able to help the kids with the homework. He still gangbanged at night, according to Bob Creer, and he said that he also started taking bodybuilding more seriously at the time. Jamel Barnes was a founding Crip member and bodybuilder, and Tookie and Jamel both became known for their bodies. Jamel wanted Arnold Schwarzenegger to sponsor Tookie for the new Mr. Olympia competition. According to Jamel, Tookie met with Arnold, flexed for him, said after he flexed with him, nah, I don't want it. I'm going back to the hood. I'm good. And Jamel said he couldn't believe what he just saw and heard when he did that. Tookie, his ex-wife, said he was hood famous and felt he could whoop the world and didn't need that 
he was famous not only for being a founder member of the Crips at the time, but also for his size and his physique. In his early 20s, he even went on the gong show. McBride said the gang unit laughed at him, but never in his face. He said gang members didn't laugh in his face either. Tookie was a very serious dude. Tookie began to lift weights more serious. He would go to clubs and parties and show off his physique for the ladies. And all the ladies loved him. No no men in the hood had the size like Tookie back in the late and early 70s. Tookie began to smoke Sherm because he said it gave him strength and he could just keep lifting. PCP, a.k.a. Sherm, gave him super strength and he used to smoke dip squares in the Sherm and he eventually became addicted. He eventually needed more money, began to rob dope men, and also commit crimes. His ex said he began to growl like a pit bull when that monster was about to come up out of him. She also said that people tend to lose their mind when they on Sherm. Ken Bell said people would say looks like took a slipping and he began to change. He lost his job as a counselor eventually and his idol that he looked up to was Al Capone. But unlike Capone, Tookie needed to make income. Now Tookie had a long rap sheet by this time, including assault with a deadly weapon. Grand Theft Auto, loaded firearms, three robbery charges, and the Crips during this time grew from three sets to 45 sets. He could go to any set and get what he wanted, but he still didn't have income and he needed cash. February 28th, 1979, he got a robbery crew together and they went to a 7-Eleven. He sends in two of the crew, allegedly, and a guy named Daryl and Tony Sims went inside. Now, Albert Owens was the clerk at that 7-Eleven, and he found those two trying to rob the register. Allegedly, Tookie and Blackie Coward enter the store. Tookie puts the gun in the back of the clerk, and he took him to the back of the store. He said, this is how you don't leave witnesses and shot him two times in the back, allegedly. Owens was making noises after he was shot as he was dying and allegedly took. He laughed the, the total amount of money that they received from that robbery was one hundred and twenty dollars on the morning of March 11, 1979. Tookie allegedly killed three members of the Yang family. He killed the father and mother first, and the daughter, who was 40 years old, had half her head blown off with a shotgun. They allegedly only got $100 for that crime at this motel. The only evidence police found was one spent shotgun shell. The cops needed the street's help in order to solve these crimes. Now, the two robberies with four people killed and little evidence left behind was very frustrating for the cops. According to Ken Bell, he said people on the street began to say it was Tookie. Now, Fred Shaw Jr. said Tookie was so famous in the hood that other people began to use his name. He was accused of things that he didn't do quite often. Other gang members called themselves Lil Tookie and Baby Tookie, etc. His friend and sometimes roommate James Garrett gave police a sawed off 12 gauge shotgun. He said Tookie bragged to him about the killings, and police got statements from Blackie Coward and Tony Sims. Both implicated Tookie as the trigger man. The cops thought it was going to be an open and shut case at first, but Garrett was awaiting sentence for extortion and receiving stolen property. Blackie was offered immunity for testimony despite a rap sheet for armed robberies with one in front of the Brookhaven Hotel. The shotgun was also questionable. 
the forensic evidence came back inconclusive. In the second round of tests, only two of 18 test fires yielded markings partially similar to the crime scene. More precise testing that did exist at the time was for some reason not done. Some people smell foul play. Bobby Creer said when he heard Tookie was busted for murder and how the murders were committed, he didn't believe it was him. He said he thinks the cops set him up because they didn't like who he was and what he represented. Fred Shaw Jr. said that everyone on the streets knew he didn't do the robbery in the store. He says the real story is he was in the back seat of the car, whacked out on Sherm, and was unable to do it even if he wanted to. Now, with testimony from the two criminals, but no DNA evidence and flimsy ballistic evidence, the prosecution sought out the death penalty. Many felt it was because he was a gang leader and they wanted to make an example out of him. He was found guilty by a jury on four counts of first degree murder with special circumstances. The sentence was death. Even though there were multiple perpetrators in both circumstances who were all known crips, all the others got around seven years or immunity, but only one received the death penalty, and that was Tookie, based on circumstantial evidence at that. Former DA Steve Cooley said the murders were very gratuitous of innocent people, and Tookie seemed to be a sick individual because he laughed. Tookie ended up going to death row at San Quentin. He began going through appeals for years and claimed incompetent defense, prosecutorial misconduct, lack of physical evidence, and when Tookie entered prison, he was on a a level one inmate, meaning a major shot caller. He was a boss. He had much love and respect from all the other inmates, and cops said that he still ran the Crips from inside the prison. Ken said it was important for him to keep an eye on Tookie even after being put in prison. Tookie had influence that could get things done on the streets if he gave the word because of his heavyweight shot caller status. He was convicted in 1981 and he did get in trouble in jail, according to reports. He attacked mates, attacked guards. He ordered the stabbing one inmate threw chemicals at another inmate and outside Raymond Washington was murdered in a drive-by shooting in 1979 so with Tookie behind bars and Raymond Washington dead the Crips began to splinter into different sets at one point it was 225 different Crip sets in LA and of course they didn't all get along and By this time, selling drugs, crack, and cocaine made things worse. The crack had brought in big money in the hood. At one point, the Crip on Crip murder rate was three times higher than Crip on blood. Original West Side Crips were old school fist fighters, according to Bob Creer. But the drugs made things out of control with guns and money. And old school Bobby Creer said, hell, he's even scared of Crips now. Now, while on death row, Tookie was attacked by another inmate. A member of the Crips attacked him with a knife and slashed his neck. It was at this time that things began to change for Tookie. He was put in solitary confinement for his own safety indefinitely. Tookie said there he was able to read and reflect on his past. He said that he read books on sociology, philosophy, and history, to name a few. He said in a gradual and piecemeal fashion, he eventually changed his life. He met up with a woman named Barbara Ben Becknell when she interviewed him for a book on gang history. She gave him a public platform to speak. He told her he wanted to help kids and eventually began to write children's books. 
He said every gang member should be apologizing to their friends and families for all the madness that has been created on the streets. By the late 80s, gang life was being glorified with music and movies. Tookie with Bagnell published many children's books and even wrote books about his experience. He eventually began to negotiate a peace treaty between gang sets and he wanted to make peace and work on peace his main mission. Fred Shaw Jr. thinks he really did make a change and want peace and said he heard about some things in prison that happened and that Tookie didn't seek retaliation. He said he heard that he could have got the guy who stabbed him but chose not to. On the other hand, Sergeant McBride didn't believe it and said it was all a front. He said the books were ghost written for, for Tookie and uh, also D.A. Cooley said he felt Tookie was faking it. He said his books were dedicated to people who were activists, but they were also dedicated to prisoners behind bars accused of killing cops. George Jackson from the Black Gorilla family murdered a prison guard. Leonard Pelted, American Indian Movement, murdered two FBI agents. Mumia Abu Jamal, the reporter, murder of a cop. And Asada Shakur, the Black Liberation Army, murder of a state trooper. The DA said it would be smart not to dedicate books to cop killers if you were about peace. In 2000, a member of the Swiss Parliament, Mario Fair, nominated Tookie for the Nobel Peace Prize for all of his anti-gang work. He was nominated eventually five more times for a total of six times. The DA said that that didn't mean anything and anyone can nominate anyone for the prize. The DA said that Hitler and Stalin were even nominated for the prize. So a lot of people in the police world were not buying Tookie's transformation. And unfortunately for Tookie, he never won the Nobel Peace Prize. Now, he did get a lot of attention from Hollywood. And in 2000, Jamie Foxx made a movie called Redemption. It was a made-for-be movie, and it was nominated for a Golden Globe. His fight to avoid death penalty got new momentum with the movie and national attention. Snoop said that the movie changed him. He had people like Jim Brown, Snoop, Winnie Mandela, Jamie Foxx, and more now fighting for him to avoid the death penalty. Prosecutor Martin said he never admitted, Tookie never admitted that he was a murderer and therefore didn't believe that Tookie was redeemed. In October 2005, the Supreme Court denied to hear his case. It came down to him needing to win clemency from the governor of California, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Now, no one in California had clemency since 1967. His ex-wife felt he was rehabilitated. Attorney General Campbell felt the rehab came too late to justify mercy for his crimes. Some thought Cripps would kill guards if he was killed. His execution date was set for December 13, 2005. Now, Arnold Schwarzenegger made history on December 8th, 2005, because he held a one hour closed door meeting to review the final request Tookie had for his life. What made this historical is because normally these appeals are conducted with paperwork, but I wanted to actually talk to the people on both sides and hear them out. And he had spoke with both lawyers normally that would never happen but this was new and he gave both sides a chance to explain their case according to the DA the big moment came when they showed Arnold the books that were written and dedicated to cop killers to lawyers 
were unprepared and they did not read the books and didn't know about that. Honor was watching them scramble right before his eyes. And eventually when it was over, Arnold wrote a statement and said after hearing both sides, he could find no justification for clemency. The Terminator terminated. A couple hundred people were outside and he didn't want any family members to come to this uh, event. He told his wife he was tired and maybe it was meant for him to die. Shaw Jr. said when they asked him, why he thinks he this was happening he said karma 50 witnesses were at the execution including 17 members of the news media at 1201 a.m he came in the death chamber he said he doesn't want to die but if your time is up then it's up they say he looked all the witnesses in the eye his witnesses pumped their fist and said, Took a media said he had a stern gaze at them. But Shaw Jr. said that at this time in his life he wore glasses and wasn't able to see that well, so he was trying to squint so that he could see everyone. While they were trying to prepare him for the lethal injection because of his size and physique, even at his age. They had trouble finding his vein and they ended up poking him more than once. He eventually asked them if they knew what they were doing. Eventually they got him into the death chamber and they administered the lethal injection. His breathing became shallow. He looked peaceful when he passed according to witnesses. He was declared dead at 1235 Pacific time. When he died, three of his witnesses yelled, the state has just killed an innocent man. There was no unrest when he died and Bobby Creer said he went out like a soldier, but it hurt his heart. He said cops think he was nothing special and just another thug and it was the right decision, but he disagreed as well as many others. It's a sad end to somebody that had a lot of potential. Tookie was once presented to Arnold Schwarzenegger as Mr. the next Mr. Olympia. He was an inspiration to many young men and became the leader of the Crips. He could have done many things with his life, but unfortunately, he ended up being led astray and this is what happened to him. Many people believe that he did turn over a new leaf and become somebody focused on peace, but we do not know for sure. He was nominated six times for a Nobel Peace Prize, but also who knows what could have happened with his life had he not ended up in jail. It's unfortunate four people lost their lives It's never been proven without a shadow of a doubt that Tookie did it and he never ever admitted that he killed those people. In the end, it's another cautionary tale about what you could or could not do and what you could and could be possibly in life. And I hope that this actually was very informative. This video is made based off of interviews and documentaries that I watched and if there is any information that is not in here it is for time constraints please hit this like subscribe enjoy the video keep in mind this is a short recap of a person that lived a long life and was very complex So, for time constraints, every single detail will not be in here, but you do get the majority of the information. I'm Jay. I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to subscribe. Peace, and I'm out. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please hit that like, subscribe, bang that bell, and I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.